Hello there, welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We are still in chapter number four where we talk about the so-called false obstacles to healing. And we were saying in the previous sessions that they are false obstacles. They are not real obstacles, but they can become as real obstacles if we believe them. They are lies from the devil. They are wrong interpretations of certain passages of the Bible. Things that probably we receive from other people and they got into our minds in a subtle way and maybe we, we haven't been even conscious of them and that's why we're doing this series so that we will go through them one by one and destroy them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And today we're discussing about the 10th false obstacle and that is I am sick or God would not heal me because I took communion in an unworthy manner. I took the Lord's Supper, I partook of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, whatever that means for you from the Bible. And we will begin to talk about this false obstacle by first reading the passage where it comes from, the main passage of the Lord's Supper or of the communion from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. If you have your Bibles ready, let's read it together. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you're welcome to use whatever English translation you have available. Let's read it together. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among, among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself or herself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Amen. Now, many Christians interpret this passage in the following way. And when you hear what I, what I will say, it will sound very common to you probably. Let's hear it. Before you take communion, you need to examine yourself very carefully, check for any unconfessed sin in your life and confess all of them. Then take the communion. This is the worthy manner of taking communion. Otherwise, if you take it with any unconfessed sin, God might punish you with sickness or even death. And you cannot come to God to heal you or reverse the sickness because you did it with your own hands. So if you feel too unworthy on occasions, it's better not to partake of the communion than to be punished by God. 
And here I end the common interpretation. Have you heard this interpretation of the communion or the Lord's Supper? And what does it mean to, to be worthy and to take it in a worthy manner? This interpretation is far from the truth. It's false. And we will see why both the fact that you become worthy by confessing sins and the fact that God punishes you if you partake in with unconfessed sins and even the fact that you should not partake of the communion if you feel too unworthy. That's from the devil. All these thoughts, all these interpretations are not biblical. And we will see how, what's the biblical way, what's the right way, the true way of interpreting this passage. Let's analyze the passage carefully in its context. First, the expression unworthy manner in from verses 27 and 29 that we just read doesn't refer to the worthiness of the person taking communion but to the worthiness of the manner that person partakes, of the method, of the way you take communion, not the person. Worthy manner, not worthy person, that you need to be worthy. But the method you take, the way you partake the communion needs to be worthy. And that's the first thing I want to establish. Because we can never become worthy to partake communion. No matter what we do, not even through confessing of sins. You don't become worthy through confessing your sins. Our worthiness was settled once and for all when we came into Christ. If you are in Christ, your worthiness is given by Christ's righteousness. You can never become worthy by confessing sin or by doing something. So that's why it's false. Worthy manner doesn't refer to your worthiness when you approach the Lord's Supper. But the worthiness of the way, worthiness of the way you partake the, of the communion. So there is a proper and worthy manner of partaking the communion. And we will see how. Taking communion in a worthy manner means first and foremost to assign to it a mental significance when you take it. To think about something and remember of someone. That's what the passage says. To think about something mentally when you partake of the communion. And to remember something and someone. Let's see uh, what. It's not just eating and drinking food. We see this clearly in three places uh, in the passage that we just read. First, in verses 17 to 22 when Paul rebukes the Corinthians for eating their suppers without waiting for others getting drunk, not thinking of Christ, and believing that that's the Lord's Supper. That was the first unworthy manner that the Corinthians were partaking in the Lord's Supper. They were eating food together without waiting for each other. They were not even thinking of Christ, and they thought that's the communion. And that was an unworthy manner in which they thought they partook communion. That was the first one. Second, then in verses 24 and 25, Paul cites... What Jesus said that when we take communion, we need to remember him, to think about him, to think in our minds about Jesus Christ and what he, what he did at the cross when we partake of the communion. And the third place where it says that we need to think about something in verse 28, there is an examination and evaluation of ourselves before taking communion. So you see, there are two things here that we need to do mentally when we approach communion. First is to remember Jesus Christ in the right way. And second, to examine and evaluate ourselves in the right way. And there's a right way of doing that and a wrong way of doing that. And usually Christians approach the wrong way uh, to, to partake communion. Let's see what is the right way to remember Jesus Christ and to evaluate ourselves, to examine ourselves. In verse 24, Jesus says, His body was broken for you, was judged for you, and in your place. So the broken bread is a representation of Christ's body being torn apart for, for you and for me. And he says you should always do this in remembrance of him and of what he did. This is what correct discernment or judgment or evaluation of the Lord's body from verse 29 is. It's a matter of where you place the guilt and judgment of your sins. 
either on Jesus' body or on you. Where do you place the judgment of your sins in your mind? In Jesus' body or on you? The same Jesus did with the wine in verse 25, which is a representation of his shed blood for you and for me. Then verse 26, every time we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death, the Bible says, or the Lord's judgment. When you proclaim the Lord's death, you actually proclaim his judgment, the judgment for your sins until he comes. In other words, if you proclaim the Lord's judgment for your sins, then you also proclaim your freedom and your healing and your victory and your prosperity, your righteousness, your peace. His death is your life. The proclamation of his death is the proclamation of your life. You evaluate and judge yourself or consider yourself in your mind as righteous, healed, and free. The proclamation of his death, as I said, is a proclamation of your life. Amen? This is so exciting news. Communion is not an occasion to be sad, to be mourning, to be crying. The communion is a celebration of life. It's a proclamation of your life. Jesus died so that you might have life. Then in verse 27, taking communion in an unworthy manner doesn't refer to a person being unworthy because of sins, as I mentioned earlier, but rather it refers to not acknowledging correctly that the judgment for your sins and my sins was put on the Lord's body and on his blood, not on you. And so by not evaluating correctly, rightly, you become guilty and come under condemnation. It's not God making you guilty or putting your, or yourself uh, under condemnation, but you in your mind, you feel condemned. You feel guilty and you accept that guilt and that condemnation during communion. And that's not correct. That's not right. So that's what happens in your mind. If you don't acknowledge correctly that your sins are already taken in Jesus' body and blood on the cross, then automatically those sins are on you and you become, you, you feel guilty, you feel condemned. That's the reason you feel guilty because you don't put rightly your sins where they should be in your mind. Then verse 28 says that the Christian must do that evaluation first in the light of what Jesus did and then take the Lord's Supper as a celebration of life for himself. So you need to evaluate first and put yourself in the right light and then take communion then take the lord's supper uh, as a celebration of life for yourself and not for judgment it's a celebration of what jesus has accomplished at the cross and that creates faith in the heart of a christian for healing and victory when you know that you're healed when you partake and you remember that what jesus did gave you healing and victory that's that builds your faith up and you have more faith for healing. The Greek word for examine or evaluate or, ju or judge is dokimazo. And it means to test and by implication approve. Test something and then approve or disapprove. Those in Christ see themselves approved by God. That's how you examine yourself. You see yourself as approved by God. And here, an old covenant picture might help to see this, what I'm trying to say. At the temple in the Old Testament, where, when people were coming uh, for atonement to the high priest, the high priest examined the sacrificial lamb. Examined the sacrificial lamb and not the one who brought it. Because the one who brought the lamb had sins. Was, was blemished. That's why he came there for. He came for atonement. So the high priest was not looking for the person's sins, was not looking to see what that person did wrong. It didn't matter. The high priest just examined the sacrificial lamb. In the new covenant, Christ is our lamb without blemish or defect. And we see that in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, and we'll read it just in a moment. During the communion, we examine him the lamb without blemish and then we see ourselves as tested and approved by him in light of his examination and of his approval as the perfect lamb for our sins then we see ourselves approved 
That's what you need to do in your mind when you approach communion. And I, I promised I, I, I will read 1 Peter 1 verses 18 to 19. It says this, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He is the lamb without blemish and without spot. And when you put your sins on him, you are approved. You are righteous. You are healed. Then verse 29 says that if someone doesn't discern the Lord's body in that way, like examining the Lord's body and seeing that it's perfect, then he eats and drinks judgment to himself. He celebrates his own judgment instead of celebrating God, Christ's judgment. He does that in remembrance of himself and of his sins and not in remembrance of the Lord. So if you try to search for your sins, try to confess any sin, then you're remembering your sin. You're not remembering the Lord's sacrifice. You're trying to remember your sin and you celebrate your judgment and your sin. When you try to confess, you're trying to pay for your sins. So you're celebrating and remembering your sins. Do you see this, what I'm trying to say? Today in the body of Christ, instead of getting ourselves free of the conscience of sins, and acknowledging the judgment of Christ, we dig up our sins during the Lord's Supper and become conscious of them, of the fact that we are still sinners. We think that we are still sinners. And that's exactly what we're doing usually during the communion. We're trying to dig up our sins. We become conscious of, and of our sins. We're, we're see, we see ourselves as still sinners when we're not. We are right. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus by nature, not just legally. Our spirit, our recreated spirit is righteous. Amen. So when we take communion, most of the time we think that this is like going to someone's funeral. We put like very soft music, very reverent. Uh, uh, some people cry, they go forward and start crying and shouting for their sins. And we create this uh, atmosphere of fear, of, of uh, sadness during the communion, like it's a funeral. And we, and we think that being in that atmosphere makes us softer in our hearts. And we remember the dead person and feel like we owe something to him or her, especially if they died because of us. That's how we behave in a funeral. We come and we soften our hearts and we think about the dead person. And then we think of a good thing that that dead, per dead person did. And we, want, it's like we feel like we want to do something in return. Especially if that person died because of us. That's how we humanly think during communion. And that's what we do when we go to a funeral. So we do the same with Jesus' death during communion. We think that the best way to pay Jesus back for his sufferings is to at least remember our sins and ask for forgiveness. As if we would do him a favor. But that's wrong. That is not remembering him. It's remembering you. And it's interesting that in Matthew, in the Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29 account of the Lord's Supper, when Jesus gave his disciples the bread and the wine for the first time, he didn't mention anything in any of the Gospels about them needing to confess their sins before partaking. You don't see that anywhere. And I want to read this passage, Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Do you see anywhere in this passage Jesus saying that you need to confess your sins? Not even in the passage that we read in the beginning from Corinthians. There's no place where the Bible says that you need to confess your sins. It talks about a worthy manner. It talks about evaluating yourself. But why do we assume that evalu evaluating ourselves or examine ourself, ourselves, it means to look for our sins and confess them? That's something added into the text. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that evaluating yourself means to confess your sins. And we will see. Uh, let's look at verse 30 from the, uh, the passage we read in Corinthians. Verse 30 says that those who don't evaluate themselves or judge themselves correctly by placing the judgment on Jesus Christ, they drink that judgment to themselves. That's what verse 30 says. That means they do not appropriate healing and strength for themselves by judging correctly the Lord's death. And thus they continue to be sick, weak and die before their time. The world is in a default state of sickness, death, and decay, as we know. And if we don't proclaim and believe your salvation through the Lord's death, you remain vulnerable to the same things that the rest of the world is vulnerable to. Sickness and early death is not a punishment from God for taking communion without confessing your sins, but it is the normal way that the world functions and to which you're no longer immune to. So communion, it's a way for you to become immune to the default state of the world, of sickness, of death, of decay. Communion, it's our ark, if you want, it's Noah's ark. It's the way that we remember that Jesus died. We proclaim his death. He died for our healing, for, our, for the remissions of our sins. And that's how we keep ourselves in health. That's, why we keep, that's how we keep ourselves healthy and strong and in victory and full of faith. Remembering and putting the judgment in the right place. And evaluating him and evaluating ourselves in the right light. In the light of the Bible, not humanly but in the, in the light of the truth that we are righteousness because he was made sin. Let's see one more explanation. In the Greek language, prepositions like for and but can also be translated as in, through, by, and because. And the translator used different uh, prepositions as they see fit, as they see the best meaning. But sometimes they don't use the, exactly the best preposition, depending on their perspective, their mentality, their framework of mind. Verses 31 and 32 in this passage can be translated in the following way. And I'll uh, put it between parentheses some explanation. Let me read. So from verses 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, that is, discern and evaluate ourselves correctly in the light of the Lord's judgment as already being righteous, healed, and free of sin, then we would not be judged, meaning that we would not become vulnerable to sickness and death while on earth as the world experiences by default. Because when we are judged, meaning that we are evaluated correctly as already judged in Christ for our sins, through that, we are chastened by the Lord, meaning that we are instructed, trained, disciplined, and we form a healthy habit of going back to the judgment of the cross in our place, that we may not be condemned with the world, being under the same perils of, as of the world. And I will read it one more time. This is kind of a New Living Translation or Amplified version of those two verses from Corinthians. What is the text? First Corinthians uh, 11 verses 31 and 32. Let me read it one more time and listen carefully how those two verses should be read in the right light. For if we would judge ourselves, meaning discern and evaluate ourselves correctly in the light of the Lord's judgment as already being righteous, healed and free of sin, then we would not be judged, meaning that we would not become vulnerable to sickness and death while on earth as the world experiences by default. Verse 32. Because when we are judged, see I replaced the but with because. Because when we are judged or evaluated correctly as already judged in Christ for our sins, through that we are chastened by the Lord. That is, we are instructed, trained, disciplined. We form a healthy habit of going back to the judgment of the cross in our place, that we may not be condemned with the world, being under the same perils as the world. That's how these two verses should be read and understood. I know they can be confusing when you just read them from the Bible, but that's the right meaning 
for evaluation and for judging yourself and judging uh, Christ, judging yourself in the light of Christ. It's not confessing your sins or digging up your sins, but looking at yourself in the right light as approved, as, as justified, as righteous, and proclaim that. Amen? So the Lord's Supper is a celebration of life and a healthy discipline instituted by the Lord to help us always remember that our judgment was put on Christ. Because it's so, it's so against our natural tendency of putting judgment on ourselves. As, and as a matter of fact, that's what we do in most churches during communion. We assign judgment to ourselves. We remember our sins. We become conscious of our sins. And we try to confess to become worthy. So the com community is supposed to be a discipline to help us uh, switch our mind, uh, shift our mind from ourselves to the judgment of Jesus Christ. It's, it's against the human thinking. It's a biblical thinking. It's Christ thinking. That, that discipline in itself causes faith to rise in our hearts, resulting in us being more healthy and victorious. If we become sick because we didn't take communion in a, in a worthy manner, that is not a punishment from God and we still have access to healing. Take away that lie that you have been punished by God because you took communion in an unworthy manner. If you became sick, you still have access to healing and health just by proclaiming with faith what we have in Christ and remembering that Christ paid for your health. Taking communion when you were sick is a great way to exercise your faith. It's saying, I don't identify myself with these symptoms, but I identify with Jesus Christ who carried my infirmities and who was wounded so that I might be healed. That's how I pray during communion. I take the bread and the blood with joy and I say, Father, I thank you that in your blood and in your body, I have healing, I have victory, I have prosperity, I have forgiveness of sins. I don't have to remember my sins. No matter what sins I did, I do or I will do, they were already taken away for good forever from me and today Jesus I thank you I celebrate your death and I thank you that your death is my life and through your body through your blood I am healed I am victorious and I'm so grateful to you I worship you Jesus thank you Jesus that's the way to take communion and that's how faith rises in your heart that's how you discipline your mind to uh, to not be conscious of your sins and put your sins in on Jesus Christ's judgment in your mind so that you can live free and not under condemnation under guilt and that part that I said in the beginning that you if you don't feel too worthy on occasions don't even partake from the communion that's demonic that will rob you of healing, rob you of victory, and it will keep you weak and sick and under death, exactly like the rest of the world. Because communion, it's our ark, it's our salvation, it's, it's a way of releasing faith when we remember what Jesus did for us. Amen? So I hope by all these explanations, I destroyed this obstacle, I, I helped you. To destroy this obstacle, false obstacle in your mind. Let's move on now to the 11th false obstacle entitled generational curses, where some Christians believe that some sicknesses on their body are caused by generational curses or genetic diseases passed down from their parents. And because of that, they have those sicknesses or they cannot be healed by God. The Bible passages that they rely on are the following. There are a few. They rely on a few passages when they think that. It's from Exodus 20 verses 3 to 6. Let's have patience and read all these passages to see where this lie comes from. Apparently it's in the Bible, but we will see it doesn't apply to us. Exodus 20 verses 3 to 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me 
but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So see, here God says that if you sin, uh, he will punish you. He will visit your iniquity uh, of your fathers to, to children from uh, up to third and fourth generations. Then we see in Exodus 34 verses 6 to 7, something similar. It says this, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. Again, you see this so-called generational curse or generational sin passed down from uh, up to third and fourth generations. Then we see in Numbers chapter 14 verses 16 to 18. Because the Lord was not able to bring these people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Again, we see the same punishment of God uh, pass, being passed down to generations. And one more, Deuteronomy 5, verses 7 to 10. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to, down to them or nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." So we see again here uh, this passed down punishment from generation to generation. Then we're moving to the New Testament and we see a situation in which the disciples thought the sickness was caused by a sin passed down from the parents. We see that in John chapter 9 verses 1 to 2 with the blind man. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that, we, that he was born blind? There's, this verse 2 tells us that the idea of generational curses and genetic diseases and sin being the cause of sickness was very common in Jesus' day. Obviously, the disciples thought that if something like that happened, it had to come from a sin and it had to be either the person or his, her parents that sinned. So the parents could pass down their sin to their children. This teaching comes from the Old Testament passages that we quoted above. So the disciples were taking this kind of teaching from Deuteronomy, Numbers, from Exodus, from the heritage of the people of Israel. However, we can see that even from the Old Testament, beginning with the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah, things regarding generational curses and passed down sins started to change even before Jesus came. And the disciples didn't know about Ezekiel and Jeremiah, but they knew about Moses. But let's see what Ezekiel, what the, the Holy Spirit says through the prophet Ezekiel and Jeremiah about generational curses and passed down sins. In Ezekiel 18 verses 1 to 4, The word of the Lord came to me again saying, What do you mean when you use, use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. That soul who sins shall die. It will no longer be the sins of parents. And God says, as I live, never use this proverb again. Children, the children will not eat the consequences of their father's sins. Then Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. 
The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Can you see how clearly? Yes, it was true in Deuteronomy, Numbers, Exodus, that God was visiting the iniquity and the sin up to the fourth generation. But here God says this, no longer do this. It says the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Amen. Parents eat the sour grapes and children reap the consequences. God instructs not to use that proverb in Israel anymore. Everyone will pay for their own sin and not for the sins and curses of their parents. This is happening before, even before the death and the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Let's see Jeremiah now in chapter 31 verses 29 to 34. Something even more beautiful. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. That man who eats, his teeth will be set on edge, not his children's. Uh, not his children's. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Amen. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. It talks about Israel. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Amen. This is so great news. In those days, you heard this expression in this passage from Jeremiah. In those days refers to the days of the new covenant. When Jesus would come. When that proverb and saying will no longer be true. Will no longer be valid. And God says this. Yes, there was an old covenant when I took them by the hand. But that's no longer true. And in those days of the new covenant, this proverb, this saying, what I said before is no longer true, is no longer valid for the new creation. Amen. Who is God talking about in verse 33? Where he says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. Who is God talking about in verse 33? Of course, it talks about believers in Christ who are in the new covenant, who have become his people. As a matter of fact, 1 Peter 2.9 says this, You are a chosen race. You are a chosen generation called out to proclaim God's excellences. You are my people, a precious possession. That's what 1 Peter 2.9 says. We, the believers in Christ, have become his people. And you are no longer under that uh, predicament where uh, curses, sins, guilt is passed down from generation to generation unto you. Yes, there may be sicknesses and diseases transmitted genetically to you from your parents, but that doesn't mean that that sickness cannot live in the name of Jesus. The power of the cross can remove any sickness, any disease, any so-called curse, sin, guilt passed down from generations, from previous generations. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then one more passage from 2 Corinthians 5.17. The Bible says about the new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The first creation was in Adam. Now you are a new creation. You look the same in your body, in your mind, your personality, but you're no longer the same because your spirit is no longer the same. It's a new spirit, a tangible spirit. It's a recreated spirit. Your generation goes back to Jesus Christ. You're no longer, uh, you're no longer, yes, you were born from your earthly parents, but you are a new creation. Your father is God. Spiritually speaking, which is more real than uh, humanly speaking or earthly speaking, your father is God. Your heritage, your inheritance is no longer in your earthly fathers and previous generations. 
you go back to only one generation, your father God, who has born you again, recreated you. So those sicknesses, those curses from the first Adam can no longer be passed down to you because you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, behold, consider, think that all things have become new. Amen? So for the new creation in Christ, all things are new. Old things are passed away. Generational curses are passed away. The new creation no longer has the third and fourth generation, as I mentioned before. The new creation goes back only to one generation. God the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I, I'm, I'm closing here. And finishing here also the 11 obstacle, the generation curses. And I hope the Holy Spirit brought clarity to your mind and you no longer believe or be in fear of generational curses, genetic diseases, things passed down from your parents. Never fear them because you have power over anything in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I'll finish with a conclusion, with an example about healing and about these all these false obstacles that we talked about. We know that at some point, Jesus fed 5,000 people, right? 5,000 5, men, not including women and children. If only half of them were married, now we have 7,500 people. Together with their children, we can safely, safely say that there were at least 10,000 people there, right? There might have been 20,000 people, but let's keep it conservative to 10,000 people. There is, there is a statistic that almost in every gathering, no matter how small or large, 90% of everybody in the gathering needs healing of something or is sick of something. That would mean 9,000 people out of 10,000. Let's be super conservative and drop it down to 50%, meaning 5,000. Let's say 5,000 are in need of healing in that crowd of 10,000. Do you want to go lower than that? Let's say it was a long time ago, they were not eating so much junk food and they were healthier. Let's cut it down to 2,500 people that needed healing out of 10,000 people. Is that conservative enough? So 2,500 people come forward for healing and Jesus lays his hands on them, touches all of them and 2,500 get healed on the spot. At least five times in the Bible, it says that he healed them all. So do you think that all those 2,500 people didn't have any sin in their life, didn't have any generational curses to be needed to be broken, they had all the faith to be healed? No, but Jesus healed them all. He didn't check up for them to see, oh, do you have sin in life? Do you have enough faith? Oh, this is a generational curse. No, he just healed them all. That's what we're supposed to do. All these so-called hindrances, obstacles, they are not obstacles towards uh, in, in the way of your healing. They need to be removed out of your mind. Otherwise, they will keep you away. They will rob you of what you have in Christ, what you rightly have in Christ. Healing, victory, uh, prosperity, blessing, favor in the name of Jesus. We'll finish here for today. And in our next session, we'll begin a new chapter, the fifth chapter, where we'll talk about valid obstacles to healing. There are a few which are real obstacles, but even with those, we can take them apart. We can destroy them so that we will not have any obstacles in, in the way of our healing. Amen. Until we see next time, I pray that God will bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.